Welcome. My name is Dio Kurosawa. I'm the Denim Director of WGSN. And we're here to talk about technology innovations. As you know, technology and innovations have really the power to change the way that we are making textiles today. But at what cost socially? I'm very honored to be asked to uh, join this distinguished panel of guests, um, true innovators. Please join me in welcoming Marco Lucetti, who is the Global Marketing Director of Isco Sanco. Uh, Giulio Bonazzi, who is also the Chairman and CEO of Aquafil. Christoph Van Han, who is uh, Managing Director of ICO or iCollect. Amit Gautam, who is the Executive President and Global Managing Textile of Lensing. And last but not least, Leonard D. Lane, who is uh, very much involved in yeah, amazing things for the Lee and Fung Academy. <laughs> so we're actually going to ask some questions to our guests, but if you have questions yourself, feel free to ask them on the fly. We have someone, I think Natasha is going to be running around with a mic. Uh, if there's something that you have pending or questions that you like burning, and you'd like to ask, please do so. We'd first like to open the questions off for Amit at, uh, from Lensing's perspective. So Lensing Fibers, question that I always have is, because Lensing is already a sustainable product, do you have a sort of filter when it comes to certain yeah, businesses or uh, clients that you deal with, or is it open to anyone? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, first of all, great to be here. Uh, just to uh, explain a bit the, the way the value chain, the way we see the value chain, uh, we directly supply to the spinners, and who are then in turn supplying to the mills or the fabric mills or the dyeing in the finishing houses, which is where we see a big part of the sustainability challenges from wastewater, from chemical use, from energy side. Uh, the second interesting thing is the, because of a market leadership position in almost all that we make, we are a true market leader, it's very difficult to actually tell our direct customer that they cannot in turn supply uh, to one particular player or another player. It's like, you know, if you're for a brand or retailer, it's like telling which customers you will allow to come into your store and which customers you will not allow. And of course, that creates a lot of, you know, from legal perspective also challenges. But having said that, we, we focus quite a bit on from running marketing campaigns that we run proactively. So I'll give you a very simple example. There was a Kingpin's uh, denim show, a very important one for the denim uh, segment just a few weeks ago in Amsterdam. And we showed a sustainable denim wardrobe where we collaborated with around 10 to 12 fabric mills. And these were at the top of the league in terms of quality and sustainability. So you have players like Kandiani, you have, of course, uh, Isco sitting here. So we worked really at the top of the players to actually proactively market fabrics containing our, our fibers. So I mean, that's how we look at it. So it's more from the marketing proactively, so you know, building on the theme of less bad and, and doing good. Actually, we think about promoting more actively the mills who actually focus on sustainability. Also, when we give recommendations, when a brand comes to us and say, who's the best mill to process lensing fibers? Because it's, it's, a, it's a difficult fiber to process. You need to have a certain technical know-how. So we recommend to them uh, from our specified mills who are actually uh, at the top of the game in terms of sustainability. Does everyone know what lensing fibers are and, and why they're sustainable? By show of hands, does everyone know? Yeah? So I believe you answered my question, but I, I will ask it in another way. Are there any fabric mills that you choose, I wouldn't say not to work with, but that are quite difficult as far as their sustainability practices are concerned, that you go there and actually help implement greater sustainability? from a lensing perspective, or is it more of like a scenario where you're giving the product to them and they're producing fibers or producing garments or fabrics that are, I guess, from their own side, 
the best way that they can do it on their own, or do you support them? Right, so I think the, in that case, what we look at is uh, come from two angles. One is actually, uh, we have a very strong uh, technical customer service who actually goes around and trains um, fabric mills, dyeing houses, finishing houses on actually uh, the best practices around uh, sustainability, uh, especially how to process our fibers in blends with cotton, in blends with linen, or whatsoever. The second important thing what we do is from innovation perspective, because what we see, there's still quite a bit of uh, challenges, as I said again, on the water and chemicals, on the on certain steps in the textile value chain. So we do innovations like, uh, I give you a very simple example of a, of a, uh, a, a fiber that we pre-dye at the production stage itself. Okay. And when you dye a fiber at the production stage, because of the deep uh, reaction and bonding, uh, first it stays, uh, the color fastness is extremely high, the second is you don't have to do any dyeing and any processing at the later stage. So I give you a very simple example of what we call modal black. Okay. It has about 60% lower consumption of water, and when water is less, then also the waste water is less. So 60% also lower on the waste water, 60% uh, less on energy consumption, and almost 90%. And I was amazed when we looked at the numbers: 90% less on chemicals. Why? Because you are actually dyeing the fiber at the very origin, when it's actually being made, instead of trying to dye you know, five steps later, and then it, it's, it's a more intense process, and also it doesn't, st uh, the fastness of the fabric is also not that good. So that's how we look at it. One is from the innovation angle standpoint, trying to address the challenges uh, where we see big uh, hot spots on sustainability, and the second is just proactive um, education of, 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 the, of the value chain. And do your brands that you, you deal with, do they recognize such innovations that you have uh, from, I believe you said, Modal Black? Is this similar to a Stay Black? Um, how, how do uh, someone at home, how do they take advantage of such things? Because a lot of the water consumption issue actually happens at home care. Is that something that you're innovating at the moment, trying to figure out ways and, and, and ways to manage that, or? Yeah, I mean, that's a good one. So I think the, the best, shot we have is to work with the brands and then tell the story very clearly to them, which they can in turn communicate to the consumer. Okay. So in this particular case, when we brand the product, we're not looking from the fiber, we are coming from the customer perspective. And right. we, had a, we had a campaign, what we call Forever Black. Right. So when you tell the customer, you know, you have a denim, which is actually going to stay forever black, and if you buy a like denim, and if you've washed a couple of times, you know, suddenly it looks, you know, gray, l gray and a lot of white patches, and you say, actually, I don't want to wear after, you know, four washes. Okay. And so, so this theme of, you know, looking from consumer perspective, in this case, the forever black campaign, and then running very proactively with the brands to actually tell that story, uh, using them to actually tell the story to the consumer. I mean, that's how we, uh, we look at it because in our, given that we are at, almost at the starting uh, point in the textile value chain, right. it was also a mind shift for us to say, okay, forget about these five steps which are ahead of us, but actually go to the very end where the customer interface is and then create the pull okay. uh, there. Ah, nice. Yeah. Well, that being said, because obviously we have Marco here from ISCO, and I'm sure he's a client of yours. Um, Marco, because ISCO is well known for being a, a huge innovator, of course, your, your client list is very impressive. Do you find that even speaking about sustainability from a product perspective, is it redundant for you? Or is it sort of inherent that people expect that you're always on the top of, the, of your game from a sustainable perspective? I mean, uh, I guess that uh, given the fact we are a market leader in the denim industry, the market itself and consumers are always, uh, you know, expecting for, from us something which is uh, outstanding. Uh, I would say that now we have been uh, practicing uh, sustainability since uh, we were born, yeah. because uh, sustainability is uh, somehow woven, just to use <laughs> as, as a word, what we do is woven into our DNA. Right. It's part of the company vision, and uh, I would say. You know, I'm always stressing out a different concept because I guess sustainability is a bit of uh, an old word mm -hmm. to describe what uh, the industry is trying to do. We do prefer speaking about responsible innovation, 
which is uh, just uh, a shift of the paradigm of our industry where, uh, you know, sometimes in denim people are saying, uh, I am producing eco-sustainable denim because of the fact I'm saving uh, water. But water is, uh, you know, just, I would say, maybe less than 10% uh, of uh, waste of resources uh, which our production is causing. So, uh, speaking about responsible innovation, we have to look at uh, water consumption, we have to look at energy consumption, we have to look at chemicals consumption, and uh, as ISCO, we really approach sustainability as being uh, responsibility, which means responsibility for production processes, responsibility also in terms of respecting uh, compliance, respecting ethics, respecting people, which are working for us uh, or are respecting the communities in which we operate. And uh, having said that, this is on the industrial part. As far as uh, the business to consumer part is concerned, I guess it's really time to shift the paradigm. I mean, today consumers are not buying uh, sustainable or responsible clothes because of the fact, I guess, that's also our mistake or brand's mistake, we are not able to convey the message that sustainable, sustainable does not mean just saving something, but also means being able to wear nice garments, which means you know, connecting fashion and sustainability is key, I guess, to make our talks being an action for tomorrow. I guess that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, I would say my, my personal dream, but also a big task or a big target for all the industry players which are connecting uh, today in uh, Copenhagen uh, is uh, to have consumers choosing sustainable or in, uh, responsible garments because of the fact they are nice. And on top of that, they are also reducing waste and uh, helping planet Earth. So I would say that our next target uh, as ISCO, but also in collaboration with brands and retailers, is uh, to have uh, sustainability becoming a main shopping driver for consumers. Because until we just talk among uh, industry players, yeah. the job is not done, really. Right. Yeah. So that's, I guess, our next, uh, next target uh, as, as ISCO. Can you give us a sort of uh, glimpse into the next two to three years? from an innovation perspective, from what ISCO is developing, what we can look forward to? You know, if it's true that uh, we have uh, to influence consumers' purchase behaviors, uh, we are ready now to market a new technology which is enabling uh, uh, denim garments to keep their original shape, uh, having less home washes, for instance. Because, right. again, speaking only about water as an example, only 7% of the water waste in, in, uh, in uh, the entire life cycle of a denim is caused due to industrial production. 93% is caused by wrong behaviors of consumers at home, which are wash, washing and ironing their jeans to keep their, in order to keep the shape. With uh, new technologies, we are able to have the jeans keeping their shape longer, which means uh, washing less, which means saving water. Then we are uh, working as well uh, on uh, new technology, in, in technologies enabling to perform uh, indigo dyeing uh, with uh, zero water or uh, with, uh, with uh, five to 10% uh, of the water we are using today. Anyhow, already today we are recycling 90% of the water which is used into our production processes, okay? So I would say that the uh, uh, two, three, two, three years pipeline is uh, somehow being able to influence consumer behaviors, also in collaboration with uh, our brands because we are an ingredient, with uh, our clients because we are an ingredient, so our products uh, do not touch directly consumers. <laughs> and uh, also being able to reduce as much as possible, thanks to technology, products we are uh, delivering to the marketplace. I think what you're doing from that perspective sounds great, but I, I would also like to applaud you for the work that you do with the students from around the world. Um, I was honored to be able to be on the judging panel yesterday for iSchool. 
But I think that kind of uh, initiative and, and starting out uh, with students so that when they blossom and, and get into their careers, they understand the, the complexities of fabric, they understand what the ISCO is doing and what it means for them in the future. That being said, um, I, I wonder with Christoph, your, your work with ICO, you know, recycling and, and, and bringing it back like full circle, how, how do you take a product similar to what uh, Marco is speaking about over a five-year period, a ten-year period? Are there limitations from a, you know, a, a recycling perspective? Actually, when we talk about recycling, the, main, the most limitations for us is right now, first of all, to get the garments. Yeah. As we saw in the morning, that we only collect 20% worldwide right now, which is way too low. So still, your perfect fibers and your perfect produced genes are still going into the landfill. This is something what we first will have to stop. And for this, the first step is always to co collect everywhere. So we had the vision to just say, so at every place where we sell something, we have to send something there. Yeah. So when we send something there, we can take something back. And so it's the best way to collect together with the retailers. But that's only the first step in the journey. And then when we collect a big pile of clothing, um, that's not, not recyclable. And when we look at numbers, when we collect 100 kilos of second-hand textiles or clothing or waste, whatever we call it, in this we will find, if we make a 100% cotton recycling, three kilos of cotton, mm -hmm. and then we can produce 1.5 kilos virgin, virgin fiber out of it to pr bring it back into the process. So it's still a very long way to get the fibers at the right place. And yes, that's our goal with our partners to achieve this. What is the best practice to, for a brand or retailers to take advantage of a technology? How do, how do they actually start the process in engaging with you? I think when we started in 2009, from the beginning, it was very hard to convince a retailer to start a take-back in-store system because we were going onto their um, working space and they, the first question was, um, how many square meters do you need? Because there's a selling space and um, no, you just have this very small spot and we actually don't want to touch the closing. So, and when we talk to the sustainability people, they really like us to start a system. Right. Um, when we talk to the marketing people, they seem to like us as well, but when we talk to the store people, and they say, right, we only have three people working in the store, and then they still have to take the garbage and bring it somewhere, and then somebody picks it up. So that's the first step, to get the companies into a position that they put garment collection into their strategy, into their living, what they want to do. And, and as we heard today, I think um, this meeting today or the summit today was uh, the best marketing show for us ever because everybody told you have to start collecting garments and for us it's cool so we just want you all to start and after you started then the next steps are that um, to get the, the right sorting procedures in place and then to integrate the recycling partners from us into your supply chain and this is the goal what we want to Gross. go with you the whole way. <laughs> okay. Does everyone know I, I collect or ICO? Okay. Does anyone in the audience ever had any engagement with, with, the, with the company at all? You in the front? Can you share your experience? Is it possible? Natasha, can you help with the mic? She's working for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, if someone else had their hand up here. It's nice to support your own brand, that's no problem. <laughs> Sorry, your name? Can you please stand? Sorry? Uh, sure. I can't see you. Hi. I'm Anita Heiberg. Uh, I'm a lecturer at Esmond University now, but I originally visited um, SOEX um, as a student at Esmond. So that was our, and I think I collect was, or the, the, the title I collect was sort of a new concept at the time. That was about f five years ago. Yeah. And how was the experience for you? Quite good. Eye-opening, eye really. Yeah. yeah really, and do you, uh, I mean, is it possible for individuals or is it more of a platform for businesses? No, it's for Thank individuals you. possible as well to have a visit there. But it's, um, mainly we do it with our partners. Um, I think we always see for us it's very important to um, 
teach our partners, to teach the people in the right position um, within the customer and within the company what they are doing. And um, one of the most important stuff is also to train the store personnel that they know why they are doing this and that they see the, the whole picture and the whole approach. And for this we from time to time have visits in one of the biggest um, recycling plants we are. But one Out could of. say this is not a great surprise. That's well, quite interesting. What I mean, we, we, we talk about great companies like ISCO. Like Obviously, lensing does a great deal yeah. on their side. But, you know, it's the old garments. I mean, I, we have a factory in Thailand. And if you go to Chattachak Market, has anyone been to Chattachak Market in Thailand? <laughs> So there in the back, I see your hand. Uh, there's enough denim there to clothe probably most of uh, Copenhagen. So, so is there any initiative from your side to be a bit more proactive and go and get garments instead of waiting for them to be presented to you? For us, there are many, many initiatives that would be very, very important for us and to change a lot of things at the beginning. And what I said, um, that we only can find three kilos of of denim with uh, 100 kilos uh, of collection. That doesn't mean that we don't find three kilos of denim, we only find three kilos of 100% pure cotton denim. Okay. So, and we always have the problem that we, that even if you have on the label 100% cotton, it doesn't mean that it's 100% yeah. cotton inside of it. So, and when we take these fibers and bring them into a new um, spinning process, it has to be 100% cotton. cotton. So, but as we know that the yeah, the most, um, it, it what we find right now in the markets so are blends, and right now um, for us it's so really difficult to instance, recycle blended materials. There are yeah, some so companies that can do poly cotton on the one side, on the other side they can do 100% polyester, they can do wool, so what do but we need? still don't have the technology breakthrough that yeah. you can take a pile of clothing through it in somewhere and then you get fibers out of it. So that we are very, very far away from the technique that this is actually working. No, you just said very far, and that was the question I was yeah. going to ask you. They are celebrating what do you, what do you think from a timing perspective for you to get to the point where you can break down the you know, they fiber really the talk, yeah? they are the We were talking the whole day about 2025 and 2030. And they're not okay. mentioned and, in this and bloody And if we talk product. about cradle to cradle, if we would now start to yeah. pros and process all the goods in cra cradle to cradle manner, then we will collect them in five years. Yeah, read the report so then we won't have these problems in 10 years anymore. Right. But right now we are not doing this. Yeah. So we now uh, have to work on possibilities how to this, process and how to recycle the textiles that are right now on the market. Okay. And we hope that the inventions yeah. on the market and will grow very, very fast. And we really hope that and yeah, some new invention will really do ours. big changes here. Or would be very interesting, I don't know if anyone have caught that, if our friends help. at Lensing yeah. and, and our friends at ISCO were to create a fabric so, um, or some fibers I that could be easily broken down and bit more robust, do you yes, think a partnership a could be in the making yeah. here? Um, and, and I think we had a very interesting is, discussion um, yesterday and I think, I think they deserve to be valued the main part is that the recycling people get very strongly integrated with the design yeah. people. Yeah. And when we look at it's, that yes, um, it's last speech from the, the Smith Foundation when yes, she said first we'll give the price. people what they actually collected. Now they are and right now, if you would give the designer all the stuff what they designed, what and then you, you, you would ask yeah. him, can you, you recycle this? Mm. And they okay say, no, I can't. And um, so again, the Aline Fisher, say, they are doing um, then, they reshape it. But at the beginning, the it took, industry. what you said, two years to first restore everything and then find uh, a way I'd what to do with it. Right. And she actually did the right step to find people to have a problem, take the designing people to change something. Right. But we have to change it at the beginning. So but designing still, in. But still we would like to work with, with all of these partners as well. Right. It would be very interesting. What do you think, Marco, if you had the next iSchool, uh, you, you, you create a fabric with lensing maybe or with another partner, or with lensing, um, that was able to be broken down quite easily mm -hmm. by the iCollect group? I mean, we are uh, already working quite uh, well, I would say, with uh, lensing fibers. Okay. And uh, for sure is, uh, you know, in order to be actionable, such a, such a plan, we need to, I guess, uh, understand if there is uh, an 
I'm sure there is because it's my job, marketing. So <laughs> if there is a, a relevant uh, proposition for consumers, because at the end of the day, we are always, we shouldn't forget we, that we should be relevant for consumers if right. we want to change uh, habits of people, right. you know. And right. if, uh, you know, numbers are uh, black, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we are, we are anyhow a profit-driven organization. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, I guess that there could be room to, to, to talk about that. Amit? Yeah, yeah, just so to build on that. Uh, I'm speaking about the, I mean, from the recycling, there are two there. Yeah. or th three different well, angles one can so take. I mean, in the morning we were talking about about 60, if I remember correctly, about 64 million tons of uh, apparel textile is made this, this year, and it will grow into about, almost above 90, right? Okay. 2030. Now. What we tend to forget is that if it's 64 so being used now, there's about 15, 10 to 15 percent waste, money, even before it actually ends up in the retail. There's a huge amount of cutting waste. Right. So if it's 60 million ton uh, being sold, actually what's being input into this whole uh, industrial machine right. is actually somewhere around 70 million ton, yeah. and then t almost 10 million ton is actually being lost so as a waste, it's still, it's still and something which is very difficult then, to use because it um, really ends up in the landfill. Yeah. Right. Now, it's, it's what really we have done is uh, so we launched uh, late last year really a, a fiber, what we call refibra, where we take the cotton waste from uh, the garment factories, the cutting waste, and instead of doing mechanical recycling, we do chemically convert it back into a new virgin tensile fiber. Today, oh, and we did a big launch with, uh, with Inditex Group, uh, starting with their different brands, uh, Zara and a couple of others to actually uh, yeah, you know, start yeah, marketing this. And this is the first time, uh, at least we know that so in the natural fibers, right. you have uh, at scale something that can be recycled from the cutting reason. waste. Yeah? So, I would, so um, they and it's now basically uh, readily available and we can, um, we are making it on a commercial production so line, the same line where we make the normal tensile. Okay. So it's not being done on a pilot line or in the lab. It's like being made on the yes. same production line where you make uh, for the normal mainstream market. And this is readily available right now? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. And do brands, does everyone know about this option? Yeah? yeah? Some? Nice? Okay. So it's, we also have a solutions lab here to, to actually uh, do that. So, so that's one aspect. The second, our vision is very clearly. We have to go for post-consumer waste. waste yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we recognize if there is a low-hanging fruit, but something which is overlooked, the waste in the whole industrial, you know, the value chain, which is about, you know, could be in the range of five to eight million ton, wow. that we can address immediately now. We have a solution, it's scalable. Uh, and then, of course, our end game is to actually do for the post-consumer. And we are working very aggressively on that, on that aspect. Yeah. Sounds amazing. Julio, before I ignore you totally, and of course, Leonard, I would like to ask you to maybe explain, Julio, a, a bit more about Aquafil. Um, I, how many are familiar with Aquafil? <laughs> yeah. Maybe just give us... A, I know it. <laughs> you a little bit? <laughs> maybe a little bit. <laughs> give us a brief introduction, and maybe at the end you can tell us how can brands or retailers, or probably brands, take advantage of your, your technology. Thank you. Well, first of all, you will discover that I'm not shy. <laughs> I think that if you're looking for a synthetic fiber, we are the solution. It's already there, it's existing, it's coming from Aquafil. Aquafil is a private company producing mainly nylon six, but also other fibers, but almost 90% of our business is the production of nylon six. We are a pretty large company, something like 500 million euros consolidated turnover. First nylon producer in Europe, 10th largest nylon producer in the world, second largest producer of carpet uh, yarns uh, in uh, the world, and then of course we work also in the apparel uh, business. Why I say that we are the solution? Because uh, we are already breaking uh, down uh, the nylon uh, six molecule into its original uh, building blocks, because nylon six uh, is depolymerizable. So when we recycle, we don't remelt, but we return to the previous chemical stage, this without using any solvent, so just using steam and heat, high heat temperatures, 
and once we have a return to the original building blocks, we can reproduce whatever type of product uh, of 906 that you may uh, look for. This means that if you give me a post-consumer uh, uh, black uh, carpet uh, to recycle, or uh, the beautiful carpet that was, for example, uh, in the concert uh, hall or at uh, the entrance, so yeah. the red green carpet which is in the entrance, which is made uh, by a fantastic uh, uh, Danish customer who is also present uh, here. In this, uh, nice pool. plug, nice plug. <laughs> if you give it back to me, I can uh, separate in all the different components, recycle 100% of this carpet, take the 906 uh, uh, yams and uh, reproduce another uh, yams that can go for uh, lady stockings or for swimwear or for uh, whatever type of fabric or of uh, plastic uh, component to be used uh, in a car or to make another carpet uh, yarn uh, again, without any limitation. For no our limitations. customer, nothing changes because, I mean, they cannot, uh, um, there is no difference, you know, since uh, we don't remelt but we go back to the, to the monomer, there is basically no difference. Thank you. So for them, uh, it's uh, wow. <laughs> exactly, exactly the same of using uh, any other uh, nylon uh, six uh, yarns. They can express all their creativity because if they want to have a white piece dyeable yarn, we can make it. If they want to have a solution dyed uh, uh, yarn, so without uh, then using water in piece dyeing, uh, they can get it. I mean, there is no uh, limitation. They can express 100% of their creativity. And uh, if they engineer the garment uh, in the proper way, we can also take it back and to depolymerize it. Just, for example, uh, to improve uh, the sustainability culture of our uh, workers, all our uniforms are made with Econil. So at the end, you know, because of course, uh, workers working in a factory, I don't know, after uh, one year or two years, uh, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, because uh, it uh, um, scratches or yeah. it is uh, going uh, damaged, uh, yeah. they put it in a can, and then from the can, we show them that uh, we are going uh, to recover uh, the material uh, inside. So for this reason, I'm not saying that uh, nylon is better than cotton or than uh, viscose, you know, because every fiber in reality has uh, properties that are unique. So you, you really need to understand what you're looking for. But if you look for a synthetic fiber, n in this case, uh, nylon 6 is, has this uh, magic, uh, which is uh, really unique. And uh, you know, we, have, we invented, in this case, uh, this morning we were talking about the uh, differences between innovations and invention. Yeah. I think, and I like to call uh, this an invention, okay. because I mean it is so disruptive that it's changing uh, completely a business. To give you an idea, already more than 30% of our total production is made with this uh, Econil regenerated fiber, and uh, in a few years we want to go to 100%. There is plenty of waste. What is the limitation thus far? You have 30% now. We are working, you know, the, the, one of the biggest uh, challenges is the reverse uh, logistic. I mean, uh, to take uh, back a product uh, may uh, result uh, to be expensive. Yeah. Second point, of course, uh, as we were saying before, uh, what we are uh, recycling today are products that are engineered, uh, I don't know, five or ten years uh, right. ago. ago. So, yeah. in this case, uh, you have two main problems, that the products are designed not to be recycled, sometimes to last uh, forever, so to, um, to, to separate in all the different components, uh, it uh, requires uh, special technologies that, for example, in the case of carpet or of fishnets, because we recycle a lot of uh, fish, fishing nets that were previously abandoned or, or uh, thrown away or lost in the sea, I mean, creating big uh, uh, problems. Uh, you know, so this is the first point. Second point, uh, please, rem let's remember that uh, the product we are recycling today were produced five or ten years ago with chemicals that today are banned. Yeah. You know, so it is not 100% uh, uh, to be uh, f given for granted that uh, to recycle is something uh, good. Uh, so yeah. this is something that we have to be careful. Mm. Through our process, because in the depolymerization, all what is non-nylon-6, uh, it remains uh, at the bottom, so it is... Uh, taken out of the, of the circuit, right. you know, we give uh, a fiber which is clean. So it is good for the next uh, um, usage and for the next uh, uh, recycling uh, cycle. So we are uh, an example uh, of a circular economy uh, system. Mm. If you read uh, the book uh, of Bill uh, McDonough and uh, uh, Michael Braungart, you will find inside that uh, they say by far uh, 
the superior uh, plastic uh, to be developed is nylon 6 because it is depolymerizable. And uh, as a matter of fact, aquafil is depolymerizing it. You know? So I, not saying that uh, we don't make any bad, as Bill said uh, this yeah. morning. Still, we have many things uh, uh, to improve and uh, to develop. Uh, because, of course, you know, our uh, you know, research capabilities uh, are, uh, how can you say, uh, somewhat limited. I mean, yeah. we, we don't have... Uh, 20,000 people, you know, making research and development and trying to solve every single problem. So we need the support of our customers and the support, uh, especially of universities. Believe me that I have no support from my supplier. No. Because, of course, of course they not. know that I'm going to replace their product. Yes. So they don't like me, uh, you know, <laughs> very much. And they make a big mistake because I am promoting nylon 6. So they can sell, they can sell also their virgin uh, molecules. You know, so that is why, uh, in terms of uh, environmental performance, because I mean, in terms of uh, uh, the product itself, there are no limitations, as I said before. Today, our last uh, uh, EPD scores minus 80%. So, Can you explain that to everyone? You know what is an environmental product declaration? You know what is the life cycle assessment of the product, for sure, you know. Okay, so of course we measure and uh, uh, we certify, we audit, our uh, manufacturing uh, system, measuring every single uh, emissions, uh, waste, uh, usage of energy, um, and, and you arrive to a number that you compare, uh, in this case, with the Virgin uh, 906. So, so if the Virgin 906 is 100 in terms of uh, environmental uh, uh, load, our product is a little less than 20. Okay. Okay? And we are approaching a limit that is difficult uh, to reduce because uh, The biggest uh, amount of this 20 today is made by transport. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, material uh, coming from suppliers that we are pushing uh, to give us, I don't know, uh, recycled paper tubes instead of uh, uh, non-recycled uh, paper. Um, wrapping uh, of, the, of our pallets uh, or to uh, ask our customer not to use wooden pallets, uh, <laughs> but to take materials uh, without pallets, which mm. is possible. Because, you know, of course, we use uh, wood uh, and, anyway, and yeah. so on and so forth. So, you know, We are approaching a limit that uh, really, I don't want to say that uh, is technical zero, but uh, getting, I mean, uh, limited by the present technology. Then if tomorrow morning uh, um, someone is inventing uh, electric trucks, uh, you know, and we can um, transport uh, yeah. our goods uh, to well, our customers so with, with uh, uh, electric then, trucks, uh, guess, of course, we will reduce also uh, this uh, were, uh, environmental um, load. You know. Can you give us an example of um, uh, a sort of collaboration or a way that you have um, currently been working with a brand? What we didn't yes, we work with many brands, you know, the latest innovations. I like to mention, I would like to mention all of them. Yeah, but please, the latest innovations. But, uh, I mean, no, I try to bring some uh, good examples, you know, okay. for example, uh, with Speedo, okay. 906 uh, is uh, largely used uh, for the production of uh, swimwear. With Speedo, we have a, a program which is called Take Back. So they force their garment manufacturers in China to recover the um, pre-consumer uh, waste that they make when they cut and sew, because what Amit was saying is more than true. Yeah. In this case, it's more than 20%. You know, when we make a swimwear, more than 20% of the fabric is lost during a, a cutting and sewing of the material. They collect it, they pack it, and they send it back to Europe. And you can imagine how happy is European Union and uh, uh, all our member states uh, to receive garbage from China. You know, of course, uh, normally we like to send garbage. <laughs> in this case, we bring it, uh, yeah, back. we take it back, yeah. and the plant is located in Slovenia. Okay. And Slovenia, for those who don't know, is a beautiful, fa fantastic country from the natural standpoint with a population which is extremely highly educated in terms of sustainability. For example, I've lived in Slovenia in 1990. We, we and separation of garbage was already in place, uh, I don't remember, since already five or seven years. You know, far <laughs> before, you know, we started in our, uh, say, uh, apparently <laughs> more civilized uh, <laughs> countries. Yeah. You know, so this is one uh, example, but then, you know, I have uh, many other examples to, to mention, especially in the carpet industry. Uh, for example, we work with a company which is very famous, which is called Interface. Interface is the largest uh, producer of uh, modular tiles, and together with them uh, we have uh, programs to take back uh, the tile, the carpet tile, and then to separate and uh, to give them back uh, uh, the yarns, as well as we have uh, with this uh, Danish customer, uh, okay. um, 
we, we do exactly the same. So we collect all the pre-consumer uh, waste, mm -hmm. and when available, also the post-consumer uh, uh, carpets, uh, and uh, uh, you know we try to recycle them. Then, of course, uh, we have to work a lot uh, with uh, uh, because, of course, we are an ingredient. So between us and the brand, uh, we have the weaver or knitter, then the garment manufacturer, and then the brand. So we work uh, a lot. Uh, <laughs> in our case, uh, we think, select um, uh, our uh, weaving uh, or uh, knitting uh, uh, partners. Mm -hmm. We don't sell the fiber as is because at the end we have to go and promote uh, or better to explain to the final uh, brand uh, what they're going to get. Normally we invite them. Uh, the biggest one, they come and audit us because they don't trust. Mm. Okay, and uh, they are mostly welcome because then when they see, you know, they start uh, from our uh, raw material warehouse, uh, which uh, a manager uh, of our called AKS, any kind of sheet, you know, put inside it's a, it's a small, uh, it's a small landfill, you know, bunch of fishing nets, uh, spent carpets, uh, a lot of different type of waste, uh, fabrics, uh, you know, it's, uh, but, you know, he, he knows, he understands yes. what, uh, what I mean, you know. Yeah. But that, that, that being said, I mean, do you not see that, uh, let's look at the retail industry in general, there's a lot of collaborations from a textile perspective from brand to brand. We see it a lot. Do you ever find that this is a possibility from your side? I mean, you're sitting at the panel right now with someone who's doing something a bit similar <laughs> to you. Uh, do you find that it's possible to collaborate in, in yeah, so with maybe last, a Christoph week, um, or uh, so well, Christoph, I, with Christoph for sure is uh, is possible to collaborate because if he's able to give me some material with a high contempt of nylon six, I will be more than uh, uh, happy to recycle. But first of all, I would like to invite him to come and visit us, you know, because first we have to understand uh, how to uh, exchange information uh, and so on. You know. So it's um, it is something that. Uh, would you would be open to um, highly oh, interesting for sure. And, and Christoph, what, what is your take on that? How, how open would you be to such a, a collaboration? Um, we are looking for any kind of, of collaboration because we have a lot of clothing that needs to be processed. And for us, it's important to have many, many partners in different ways. And you are specialized for for nylon six. And I think five years ago we had a um, carpet recycling plant in the United States. And there was the main problem that we had nylon six. And nylon nine, nine which was or something which like this, which was not recyclable, something like this. No, they were recycling just nine and six. <laughs> yes. Then they closed down because getting, they were getting, not uh, competitive. And so it's always the point that it's, um, um, for us, we are very, very keen to. Um, at that look on the level. market to see um, who's doing what on the market to find the best way to process company. something. Um, but the and in the second like place for us, it's, it's very important to have a very, very wide um, network worldwide. Because right now when we collect something CI, um, in Copenhagen, it will be sorted in Germany, so in our plant, and then the recycling um, materials may be shipped to China or to India to be reprocessed. So so I think as we are collecting worldwide, it's important that we collect the stuff we collect in the Asian area will be recycled there and the European stuff should be recycled here in right. Europe right. and then so reprocessed. So for this garment, it's a perfect solution um, that you could ship these goods and, a and leave them here the until the recycling the stage um, because when really you ship at the end just the, the pellets or the fibers, the that that's a very big condensed shipment. Right. Yeah, so that's <coughs> makes, that makes sense to ship this because right now we have to ship the virgin cotton from Egypt to Bangladesh as well because right. we want this cotton there to be to be processed, so this is a chain that we are uh, that we are used to it. That this is the right chain. Then, and Leonard, how do you see um, the, the the academy uh, taking part in such a collaboration? Maybe you can explain a bit of the academy as well. As well. Can you hear this up back out there? Yeah, we're uh, uh, in a little bit of a unique position. Uh, the academy was set up eight years ago by Victor Fong. Uh, to do basically two things. It was originally designed to uh, develop uh, a set of leadership practices for the future yeah, for our top 3,000 people, but uh, we quickly uh, became into the issue of accelerating learning as we have to accelerate yeah. learning across our entire She's factory base. And so we added two parts to it. Uh, one is we uh, put a uh, sustainability team in place to do research and development. We now call it our supply chain futures team. 
And we uh, basically yes, went out to uh, a firm yeah. that some of you know called uh, IDEO, and we hired their Shanghai uh, office, or we stole them is a better way to say it, and brought them in to help us kind of speed up innovation. And so what, uh, what we do in terms of uh, collaboration here is uh, starting from where the academy sits, we look down our supply chain and we look for a couple of things. One is we look for different ways that we can enhance this basically sustainable production that's currently going on now. So we have a number of things that we're doing all the way to from uh, DNA tagging so we can actually see the fiber coming all the way through the production, all the way to the customer side. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with sensors uh, right now to be able to deal with energy efficiency, water usage, uh, air quality in the plants so that we actually have much better and we can, I'm going to call sustainable working conditions that, uh, that are uh, going to be good for the future. And um, all of that is now coming down to something very interesting for us, which is data. And you talked about it this morning. And so when we're thinking about what the, uh, the technologies of a fiber and the technologies of material that run through, uh, that run through the, uh, the, the plants that, uh, that we use, and remember that we don't own any factories, so our job really is to be an influencer and an orchestrator to help bring those factories to the point where they are uh, in a position to optimize the use of the material that they get. Uh, so I want to start with one end. We're dealing with the question of reverse, uh, of reverse logistics. We are a supply chain orchestrator. We know how to use the normal, what I want to call supply chain, pull through to a customer. And now I'm turning the customer around and I'm saying, how do I actually handle the reverse side of this? Uh, so we're taking a look at uh, basically how to optimize that supply chain in reverse, and we're doing some work around the optimization formulas. But probably the most important, and I am going to change the subject here, <laughs> is, uh, is we're looking more than anything else, if we think about the whole issue of sustainability, we're taking a hold of back as the, they, we talk about kind of how we're pushing the edges of the planet. We're taking, our hypothesis is now is we need to deal with the demand side. And looking at the demand side, you heard this morning uh, Dave Roberts talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and machine learning. We're experimenting with that in a fairly good sized way. And what we're looking at is how do we able to use that, uh, that basically, that software, although we said artificial intelligence will eat the software and every company uh, you know, is going to be eaten by software, that the actual answer is every company is going to be a software company. And so you have to deal with the data. So what we're looking at is now saying we can use good predictive, we can use uh, data, we can you put it into uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning, we can kind of begin to figure out what the demand is going to be literally by product, by style, by color at the locations you're going to sell to. The minute we kind of get a stronger figure on that, we actually are in a position to begin reducing demand uh, in terms of the uh, consumption. Now when we think about that and say, how do I then take the recyclable part of this and say, if I've begun to reduce demand, I've got two things to deal with. One is, what's already there? How do I take that and I optimize that back through a reverse process? That means it's going to basically go back through a piece of our process and how do we help make our factories, the factories that work with us, uh, put them in a position to be able to actually do that because that's a whole different set of technologies. Uh, the second part of it is going to be uh, once we get that, how do we build that back into the demand cycle again? So we're beginning yeah, to look I at the whole issue of it's now not a no longer yeah. supply chain design. We're taking a look at demand side uh, demand side design. When we look at demand side design, uh, if for those of you in the audience that's a snowboarder and I'm not, you think about what we call a front side flip, is grabbing the front of that board and turning it the complete other way. So from a fun group point of view, uh, and what the academy does is we're looking now at doing a number, and we are doing a number of experiments to be able to test each the concepts that you're putting out here. How does that play into a demand and B, how does that then play into how the, uh, the supply chain that we currently have needs to be adapted to be able to what that future is? So we're interested in what we do is we accelerate learning, but we are accelerating learning not on what's happening now. I want to use a, uh, we're in Denmark, so I can actually use a, you know, a hockey example here. We don't think we're going to win anymore by skating to where the puck is. We think really our answer and where the academy sits is we're skating to where the puck is going to be. So as this research comes out from the gentleman here, our answer has got to be 
what can we do down on the demand side and what can we do on the technology side to be able to optimize supply chain design to meet that? And that's kind of where the academy sits now. So, you know, you're saying you're moving towards the puck, you're essentially uh, using that data to kind of predict how things are going to occur and reducing the development cycle, I guess, from a brand's perspective, reducing, I guess, materials because you know what will yep, be um, in so demand. Are you able to then work with this part now, of the supply chain and, um, in order to um, help them with to the create things that are a bit um, more, uh, so and well, Alex predicting what will be in demand as um, well? And it's really yeah. a program uh, the answer is, the short answer is yes. The long answer is I'm not a mathematician, so I won't. I don't have all of your data. But you know, if there was a mathematician in the audience, they could stand up and help me through this one. But once we, you know, once we actually have data around the drivers of demand, uh, you feed that basically, you feed that into the algorithm, which goes ahead and feeds that into what the you know machine learning can do. So for all of you that are buying everything from Amazon, you wonder how Amazon knows exactly what to put in front of you. That's you know, and Jeff Bezos just put it in his uh, his annual report in the president's letter. He talked about artificial intelligence and machine learning. The core thing is once we have that kind of data, you know, then we can sit down. If you you can ask the question, and you ask the question, whatever the pain point is, you're looking at you ask the question the data scientists can pull that together and show you where the kind of the correlations are it was quite but challenging to that's not I mean that's black box and, and it's sort of the magic but the business people have to be able to sit down and say what does that mean to me you've got to then be able to run that back down the supply chain so the analogy that, that we like to, to look at because it's fairly easy for us to understand is if you take a look at the uh, and some people here in the room saw this movie and I don't, I don't mean to, to plug war at all, but they saw this movie American Sniper, mm -hmm. and you saw the sniper with this guy sitting next to him that was a spotter. Well, in reality, that spotter is actually a kid with a degree in information technology, and he's drawing down from the, you know from the uh, from the from the, from the internet from the cloud data that that sniper needs to understand the ecosystem. And so, what we and to look at the supply chain like this, what we need to do is. You have to. You need the, what I'm going to call the data scientists. You need the geeks. You need the people that actually, if you give them the data and ask them some questions, they can start to figure out what those correlations are like. And then, from what your perspective, you say, given that, this is what I could do on the on the production side. What we then come with that. So what does what does that do to how we design that supply chain in mm -hmm. order to meet that? So the pieces I think we call them. Everything is now connected. I can't separate that anymore. Uh, and so from the Fung Group and the Lee and Fung point of view, that's how we see the future, and that's what the Academy is focused really in our, this next two and a half years of our three-year plan of doing. So there is a sort of initiative to try and bring in this part of supply chain as well? We haven't reached out as probably as much as we could have, but as you know, because we do work through this process, um, as you reach out to us or we reach out to you, there's a, we're a firm believer in rapid experimentation. Okay. And you know, I've seen, uh, particularly in the last day and a half here, quite a few opportunities where you use the word collaboration. Yeah. Uh, collaboration in a way is we're breaking down some silos. Yeah. There's collaboration if we can sit down and say, let's take a look at the demand chain that's coming out of what you're talking about and saying how can we fit into that part in a way to optimize it. Yeah, because from the audience, I'm sure most of you are brands or retailers and you're trying to figure out how how do I take advantage of this type of technology from a brand's perspective. Um, but I also would like to change sort of the direction and ask, with all these innovations, um, so that way, that it's way often that you're in, you, you mentioned the word silos, just, just but from a technological perspective, you're also very much segregated from the general population as it relates to, let's say, the typical working man, well. if that still but exists. We've, we've got a lot more is, is your technology in any way removing, let's say, jobs from, uh, from the industries that you're currently working in, or will it, do you predict that it will be removing jobs? Well, if the press would turn off all their recorders at this point, um, and uh, you know, I, I'm from the United States, so let me just—I've I've got to now make a political statement. I want you to put aside—I want you to put aside this issue we have in Washington D.C. Uh, with the blonde hair and the red tie, uh, uh, and kind of put that aside for a moment, and I'll talk a little bit about how we look at the world. Um, 
the, um, the company is 111 years old, and uh, we grew up in Canton, now Guangzhou, and migrated to Hong Kong. We operate in 60 different economies. I think on any given day, and uh, Pamela Mara is out in the audience who works on my team, I think we can roughly say on any given day there are three to seven million people working in factories, which we don't own those factories, that in one form or another are involved with making something that we are producing for the brands and retailers. Okay. Uh, so we take that figure pretty uh, very seriously. And as we take a look at that, uh, the Academy's motto, which we adopted a few years ago, we don't say we optimize supply chains, we don't say we <laughs> optimize network orchestration. Our, our, our core value is changing how the world works mm -hmm. because we think we have some opportunities to do that. Uh, and we do that in a number of areas. But the question you asked is about jobs. So I'm a, I'm a manufacturing guy. I'm a technology guy. You know, I can, I've, I've been involved with some of the first robotic experiments in the United States. I've seen what they can do. We take a look at that literally every single day with some of the top robotics people yeah. in the world. We're taking a look at, you know, we call it manufacturing 4.0, what that is going to. And <clears throat> we also take a look at the at another, what I'm going to call macro issue, is in the world we come out of, we're based out of Hong Kong, we're a Chinese basically family-run corporation. Uh, however you want to do the counting, and whatever year you want to pick, but roughly by 2038 there's going to be 3.8 billion more people that are consumers in our part of the world. That's the largest growth area. They're going to be mobile enabled. They're going to be able to go to market and demand in some very, very different ways that some of us can't even imagine yet. Those people are coming up from the lower part of the pyramid into the middle part of the pyramid. I, uh, we stop using the word glass ceiling, and we're saying our job is to get them off the sticky floor. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so in doing that, uh, we have to recognize the value of what that brings to the world. And while I can look at automation and I can, you know, I can take a look at most of your factory lines and say I can figure out how to put robotics in, I can put the sensors in, I can give you all of that. But what are we going to do to the social dimension of what all of that is? Yeah. And so we look at technology and say what can the technology do <clears throat> to create abundance for us? as opposed to taking things like, away. Yeah. And we think there's some huge opportunities. I could go on for another day on this. <laughs> but the gentlemen here, are in a way, a number of you are producing part of that abundance. You know, And so we think where the collaboration fits within that kind of larger macro area. Nice. <coughs> any questions from the audience relating to any of the, the subject matters that we spoke of? I'm sure you have. I mean, this is very technical. So I have questions. No? Please. Um, I had a question specifically about uh, Aquafil. Um, I have a student who's a master's student who's doing a collection on swimwear and has worked with Econeal previously, but um, she's focused around microplastics and obviously within the concept of circularity and also, um, y you know, when we're talking about recycling, we're also talking about in a certain extent, designing for disassembly as well. So um, maybe from the concept specifically from s swimwear, if you want to address it that way, or, or you know, those two key focus areas, how are you dealing with disassembly and, and microplastics? Well, microplastics, of course, are a big problem, as, uh, as we know, and uh, that we have to solve as quickly as possible because if you don't keep our uh, uh, oceans uh, and seas uh, cleaned, uh, we will simply disappear, you know, if we want to feed the... Uh, uh, humanity during the next uh, decades uh, with proteins, the only way we have to do it, uh, if, we look, if we are looking for animal proteins, is to go in the sea and to try to uh, increase the aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture uh, production, you know. So, but if we eat uh, a fish uh, with plastic inside, uh, I mean, it is not uh, something that uh, I personally <laughs> like. As, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the point. Um, it is important uh, to go more deeply in detail and understanding uh, what are these microplastics and where they are coming from. Disgregation of uh, plastic uh, abandon in the oceans, this is one uh, source. Uh, washing machines at home, second uh, source, so we have of course uh, to work uh, from the technological uh, standpoint uh, to try to uh, create appropriate filters or for example during uh, uh, an event in Berlin, I met a guy who invented uh, 
a nylon bag where to put uh, your clothing, because nylon is not, uh, if it is made uh, by filament and not by staple fiber, and if you know the difference between filament and staple, sh should not lose uh, microfibrils in, uh, uh, to, to go out with, uh, with the washed uh, water. So he has made uh, uh, a special nylon bag uh, engineered in a way that uh, detergents may go through so you can wash your stuff, but I mean avoiding that uh, microfibers are, uh, are going out. So this is resolving, uh, if, it, if it works, and apparently it works, uh, the problem of applying filters to your washing uh, machines. You know? So it is important uh, that uh, in institutions and universities, they keep studying uh, the phenomenon of the microplastic to better understand where they are coming from, you know, the type of uh, fibers. You know. Recently, for example, the polyester uh, piles have been uh, also accused of uh, uh, losing uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, material. So, uh, out of a swimwear, if it is made with continuous filament, uh, I would say that it is very difficult uh, to have uh, uh, loss of uh, uh, filaments that go in the in the sea or in the in the ocean and that are going to pollute. Uh, uh, to pollute. Then, what was the other uh, uh, question? Uh, Design for disassembly, so especially with ah, swimwear, this, uh, you have the elastics you know, and things. We are like touching this. a very sensitive uh, point <laughs> because. Uh, if you have a garment uh, which is made outside with nylon, inside with polyester, and the bottoms are made with the third uh, material, and then the pocket is applied uh, because I like it, uh, you know, of uh, that special material to disassemble this garment uh, is a kind of nightmare. So we need your support to understand how to better use our fibers, mine, the one of Amid, uh, I, I, as, as pure as possible, you know, because if they are pure for us, of course, uh, to recycle them is very easy and completely inexpensive. I try to give you one point. Uh, product, the reason why my EPD is very low is because the process uh, is very efficient. It means that in the first cycle, nylon is more expensive than polyester. But if you give me a pure nylon garment to recycle, the next fabric or yarn that I'm going to deliver will be competitive with polyester. So the point is if you want to change uh, and to go out uh, of fibers that are less uh, recyclable, or less economically recyclable, because this, you know, sometimes uh, they are recyclable but are not economically recyclable because the technology has not yet been invented. I mean, we need your support to make beautiful products, possibly with one uh, single uh, ingredient, because of course in this way it is much uh, easier. If you make a fabric, I don't know, a nylon cotton fabric, uh, cotton uh, in weft and nylon in uh, warp, of course, to, 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 to disaggregate the fabric, I would say it is almost impossible. impossible. Yeah, but I think it's an important thing you say because the most of the trends, if you look in the fabric construction, is towards blends. More and more blends, you know, four components, five components construction. Now, you're absolutely right, you know, spot on. Uh, to dis dis uh, and even from your perspective, even mechanical recycling becomes difficult. Chemical process becomes a nightmare. Uh, but the entire trend, uh, from the retail perspective, is to actually bring more and more components, bring more and more functionality towards consumers. So I think we are kind of yeah. one side, <laughs> we're going in an exactly different direction where we need to be from the design for uh, sustainability or design for disassembly or circularity. I mean, that's a very difficult thing. Obviously, trends are trends. They are obviously not something that are, they're, they're obviously changing constantly. Um, there's a big move towards things that are less denim-like and more yeah, non-denim-ish with a denim uh, right. base. Uh, I assume that you're dealing with that um, from a technological perspective. I will not ask you to reveal if you are or not. I assume that you are. You are. Um, any more questions from the audience? Please stand. Thank you, Scalia, from the European Textile and Cloth Industry. Um, you have correctly celebrated all the environmental performances of fibers and regenerated fibers. Uh, last month, a few months ago, I was in Premier Vision Fair, and I saw a tensile logo on a, on a fabric supplier shop, and I asked, What's, why are you advertising that? Because of environmental uh, aspects? And they said, no, because the lady likes the fact that it's soft, and it gives a nice property to the fabric. So. This is in contradiction, in a way, also to how you advertise your fabrics. Um, and that brings me to the point that we work so much to enhance the environmental properties of what we do, but 
many consumers still look at very simple things like price, like is it soft or not, like how much I buy for it, I pay for it. So what is your take on consumer education in this regard? How could that be um, supported? Who wants to take that, Marco? Yes. Yes. I mean, the, we, we were saying before that uh, educating consumers is key. At the end of the day, if uh, they do perceive the value of uh, fabrics or the value of garments, it's because the garments are nice. So at the end of the day, our role is uh, to push for nicer garments, fashionable garments, made out with uh, good uh, environmental uh, uh, ingredients. You know, we, I guess the role of the industry is really try to push a different understanding uh, at consumer's level. And uh, the solution, I would say, is uh, about uh, having, uh, you know, uh, uh, fiber producers, uh, weavers, uh, garment makers, brands, and retailers working together to give uh, a strong information to consumers. I guess that, uh, uh, you know, education is key. How to do education or how to perform a better education I guess that it could be a point of discussion, but first of all, we should deliver a nice fashionable, fashionable product to consumers made out with good ingredients. Then most likely today, social media and uh, digital activations are helping uh, in being in touch directly with consumers. And uh, I would say that education could go through such collaborations all along the value chain and uh, brands should definitely uh, somehow be, be on our side and uh, most likely uh, joining uh, traditional marketing or marketing communication activities together with uh, uh, digital and social media activities we will be able to better educate consumers. But again, first point is to deliver to consumer, cons consumers a product which they do like, a fashionable product. Thank you, Marco. That's great. Thank you all for joining the panel today. Thank you all for attending. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, if you have questions afterwards, we'll, I'm sure these guys will be happy to answer. But thank you for joining. Thank you.